the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, this is the Entree Leadership Podcast, where I take calls from leaders like you about what it takes to win at any stage of business and leadership. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host, with over 30 years of leading in the trenches. Yeah, really doing this stuff. I had those meetings today, just like you. So, practical hands-on stuff. If you want theory or think tank, you probably ought to go to one of my buddies who writes about that stuff. I don't do that. I read what they write, and then I go do our stuff. So there you go. Check it out. 844-944-1070 is the phone number if you want to be a caller on the show. 844-944-1070. Or you can leave the question at entreleadership.com slash ask, and we'll work you in. Mandy is in Atlanta. Hi, Mandy. Welcome to the Entree Leadership Podcast. Hi, Dave. Thanks for taking my call. My pleasure. What's up? So um, my husband and I are in the hospitality industry. We own a hospitality group here in Atlanta. Um, We've been in the business for about 20 years and more um, as well. We do about $25 million in sales uh, annually and have about 250 team members. So my question is, as we're trying to do more with what we have and grow our sales to eventually 50 million uh, in the next five years, how can we do more with what we currently have? And my thought was getting into the teaching business. So using some of our leaders, our senior leaders uh, to teach others what we know. And so we're already doing that with our own team members and curious uh, about one, how to compensate those individuals. uh, And then also, you know, kind of what would stop them from sort of doing that on their own, I guess is the question. You have a successful restaurant business that you're growing Mm -hmm. and you want to start teaching people outside of your business. That's correct. Yeah. Why? (laughs) Well, growing a restaurant and opening a restaurant is, is very, um, well, it's a huge investment of time, energy, money. Um, so so why would you distract yourself? Well, that's, that's kind of the question. These people already have, um, you know, daily tasks. And the, I also the, the, You like, mean the people on your team that would be doing the yeah, teaching? Correct, yes. Yeah. They're, they're they, don't, they, don't have the ban- they don't have the bandwidth to become teachers, yeah. Not, probably not at the moment, yes. Mm-hmm. Why I would want to do this is I feel like we have uh, have a lot of experience and a lot to share with our industry. Um, I think this is an area where industry struggles and people development, training, you know, systems, things of that nature. So I think we have a lot to offer. Okay. Um, I, 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 I think you have knowledge that when shared would be very valuable with someone. I don't think there's any question Mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it, I, I struggle with it being a distraction. And uh, the second thing I struggle with in your situation is you're going to use up resources and bandwidth you don't have. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to staff this. Right. Because the restaurant business is freaking unbelievably hard work. (laughs) It is. Mm -hmm. And you just want to go ahead and put something else on their plate, no pun intended. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you guys, your people work. Mm -hmm. That You work. You guys work hard. Or you're not successful. It's not an option. Mm-hmm. This is a showing up thing in your world, isn't it? Yeah. No, it is It is a lot of work. It is a lot of energy. It is a lot of out, long hours. Um, now, you don't have is, six hours to put on one of your managers. Right, to go film a, a course. Or exactly. You don't at the moment, certainly, yeah. Exactly. So uh, you've got to backfill a manager to give them right. the bandwidth to do it with a hire or you've got to uh, hire someone to just do the teaching or you've got to subcontract it to an outsider. But, um, but even then you got to put your people somehow in front of the camera to do the taping. So it's so that it's got some credibility because, you know, you know, I don't want to learn from some actor. I want to learn from sure. somebody who really did it. Um, and then you go, okay, Once I say all of that, then your mind is already going because you're running a $25 million business. You're not, Mm -hmm. this is not your first ride on this truck. So you're Mm -hmm. already going, I got to ROI all that. Mm -hmm. Right. So now I got to make money on this course. Sure. And the marketing of it, et cetera. Yeah. I know. You're you're opening another business. Right. 
Yeah. So you have to basically I'm not to telling you not to do it. it. I'm just, mm-hmm. this is not just something you can do as a hobby in your spare time is my point. I, Cause yeah. you don't have the bandwidth to, mm-hmm. you don't have that. Your people don't have the bandwidth. So yeah. Mm-hmm. You, so you've got to run out of pro forma and say, all right, if I staff this and we drop, you know, a hundred thousand dollars worth of bandwidth in this and payroll and other things, or, you know, having to staff up to create margin where I don't have to create it now to give them room to have the time to step in front of the camera and do the talk. Uh, then I've got to be able to sell the talk and, the, and I got the camera equipment. I got the probably subcontract out the, the production for now. I wouldn't bring in production right. people. Do you have a successful operation? Uh, and, and then you figure out how you take the, the you know the course and figure out who's going to buy it and how much they're going to pay you for it and can you ROI on that. Otherwise, what you've got is just a ministry. You're just doing this for the good of your heart and just you know helping out. And so whatever checks you write are just you know you just uh, you don't expect an ROI on. It. So yeah, I I think you're opening another business to do this the way you want. Uh, occasionally speaking at a restaurant conference or something that's different than what you're talking about this is the entree leadership podcast your business is humming but now you're falling behind your team's buried in manual work it takes forever to close the books arriving at one source of truth is like pulling teeth if that describes your business you should know these numbers 36,000 25 and 1 36,000 businesses have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle because NetSuite is the top cloud financial system for streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs and one. Because with NetSuite, you get a customized solution for your KPIs in one efficient system, one source of truth. You can manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need for better decisions, all in one place. Plus, right now, download NetSuite's KPI checklist for consistently excellent performance for free at NetSuite.com slash Ramsey. That's netsuite.com slash Ramsey to get your own KPI checklist for free. Entree Leadership Master Series is coming up this November. In-room tickets are gone, so you've already got FOMO. But you can still join us on the live stream. You've heard us talk about the stages of business, the six drivers of business. But if you're a business owner trying to level up to the next stage, you need the tactical advice to get there. That's what Master Series is. And we're going to be live streaming it this November. This conference will be a deep dive into the skills you need to grow your business through every stage. This is not theory. These are the lessons taken directly from our playbook at Ramsey, moving from a treadmill operator stage all the way through the five stages to the legacy builder stage. So if you've been on the fence about getting some skin in the game, well, uh, you're about out of time. You need to do this. The live stream is November 6th through 9. Go to entreleadership.com slash live stream. Jerry is in Bend, Oregon. Hey, Jerry, how are you? Doing great, Dave. How about yourself? Oh, better than I deserve. What's up? Well, got to say you're a predictable guy on that answer, but um, hey, thanks for uh, thanks for having me. So a little bit of background on my business. Um, I started a welding business, uh, right after college about four years ago and, um, things are going really well. Last year we did about $600,000 in revenue. This year we'll probably do 1 million to 1.2 million in revenue. And wow. Yeah, thanks. And probably we'll net around 400,000. Um, so kind of what we specialize in, we build and sell flatbeds for pickup trucks, which are the aftermarket upgrades that replaces the stock pickup bed. Mm -hmm. Um, so we kind of got two divisions of the business. One of them, we build and sell the flatbeds out of our shop here in Bend. And then secondly, we license our product designs and marketing process to other welding shops around the country. So my question is actually specific to that. Um, just because, so I I was wondering, uh, on that side of the business, the licensing side, how to make the vetting process better, for our new dealers um, cause our, our dealer success rate in terms of we require a certain quota of units to be sold for them to stay in the program 
it's not nearly as high as I would like it to be. So I thought it, you'd be a great guy to answer this question since it's kind of similar to your ELP programs, um, kind of a similar model where, you know, we find qualified welding shops, they use our process to build market and sell these beds. Um, and, and it has, um, improved a little bit, but it's kind of around 50 to 60% is what our success rate is. The other 40% don't make the cut. So just what are your thoughts on making the bedding process a little better for our, what uh, have you figured out that the difference is between the ones that make it and the ones that don't? Yeah. Yeah. So the first thing, and we've, we've already changed this was, um, we require everybody to be full time with a welding shop for at least a year. Okay, so you um, can't make it unless you've been. You don't have a chance of making it on average unless you've been open a year. Okay, that's one thing. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, part, you you tried some part timers and they don't cut it. Correct. Yep. So no, no question. That, that makes sense. Okay. What else have you learned? Um, the other thing that we've learned is it's actually kind of an, an odd problem where you know on the one side there's guys that aren't established enough and they just you know they just don't seem to know enough about business and sales to make it work and on the other side of the coin we've licensed some bigger shops you know doing five ten million a year um, and those guys you know some of them had made it but some of them it's just like I don't know if we didn't charge them enough money and they just you know kind of forgot about it because you know in, in their case what we charge for the licensing fees are about you know, two days worth of revenue for them. So it's kind of one of those things where, you know, they, they get in and then they just kind of forget about it sort of thing. So I'm kind of looking for, you know, do you think we should raise the price and, um, you know, people will take it more seriously if we raise the price. Cause there's some of them that, you know, we charge the licensing fees are five grand to get in. Um, and some of the guys, you know, we, they get in and they, they make $50,000 profit their first year. And so then they pay you, uh, they pay you additional per unit. Yeah, the way that we, we don't do a royalty percentage, we basically just have them under contract to buy certain parts on a per unit basis from us. And then we also have a, a small annual renewal fee of 750 bucks per dealer. Um, so it's five grand up front. They, they are under contract to buy a minimum of about $3,000 worth of parts from us per year and then $750 to renew. Yeah. So um, probably tiered pricing would help you. Um, the okay. way you said, based on their gross revs, you say, you know, the entry point is one to 5 million in gross revs and that's 5,000 bucks and you buy our parts from us. If you're five to 10 million, we expect you to do more volume. So we're going to charge you 20,000. If you're, uh, 10 million and above, we're going to charge you 40,000. Okay. Yeah. And, um, because, you know, because what you want is you want someone that wants this, you want the product line to be a reasonable mix. You don't want to be two percent of someone's product line, right? You, you want to be you want to be one of the things they do. And I don't know what percentage of the product line it is, but out of their gross, you want them to be making something. And if they pay a little bit more for it, as you said, they're going to value it. And then that may flesh out that they're just you know they were just going to put they wanted to take you off the market so you weren't going to be at the competitor and put you on the shelf. That's probably what happened to you on a couple of the big ones. Uh -huh. They said, this is a good process. We're probably not going to do many of them, but we sure don't want the guy across town doing them. So we're going to take it and put it on the shelf for five grand. Okay. Yeah. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. They, they were taking you off the market and du du you got dusty on the shelf. You did. So right. yeah, that's, I that's see. happened to us before. Uh, where people want to buy ads as an example, and so that they can hold that category and keep the competitor from getting the category. They really weren't interested in a long-term partnership with the Ramsey brand. They just w didn't want someone else to have one. Uh -huh. And we've run into that a time or two. Um, and so that's become part of the vetting process. So sometimes uh, price changes will weed out uh, that kind of stuff, because it's just too expensive to put you on the dusty shelf then, uh, relative to revenues. Uh, and if you're not going to do anything with it, we don't want you, but if you're going to do something with it, 40 grand's a great deal for a $20 million business. Right. Yeah. So how do we, cause one of the things we do is we, we have everybody run through a demo before, you know, I'm usually the guy that's on the interview call with them to vet the dealers. Um, they go through the demo, which kind of explains how it works. It explains the pricing structure. So how do you propose or what's your idea on, you know, because if, if we say it's tier based on revenue, obviously the temptation for these businesses would be to, to fib on the amount of revenue they're doing. 
I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't bring that up before I, you know, early in the call, we're qualifying. We're going, hey, what's your gross revenue? Right. And then we're going okay. to talk about, okay, well, in your area, our pricing is this. Okay. But I wouldn't present a tiered on, the, on your website. Right. You know, they got to okay. find that out because that way that, you know, you just find out what's going on. Hey, so how much gross are y'all doing? How, how are you, are yeah. you doing enough to even fool with this? You may not be big enough to do it. And then they, then they'll brag. Right. Yeah. And then, okay. uh, you know, so, but I, I, you know, the other thing you want to do is this, um, in, in marketing or in sales, the most powerful sale you can make is a negative sale, which is, uh, is worm fishing. You make them want it and then you take it away from them and make them chase it. And so, right. you know, we want to, you know, we've got to ask a few questions to see if you qualify to be one of our dealers, not on one knee. Would you please, 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 please be one of our dealers. We need yeah. to see if you actually fit in. And, you know, the truth is that that's also the truth because you don't want certain kinds. You've already established you don't want part-timers. And we've already established we don't want a large one that puts us on the shelf, doesn't do anything with it, because we're just a, you know, we're, we're, like you said, one day's revenue or something, that kind of deal. So that's what you want to avoid. But, hey, man, really cool. Well, I love your business. I'm proud of you. That's a great job. And you're being really creative on how to grow it without having to do all the welding. That's pretty cool. Very, very nice job, man. This is the Entree Leadership Podcast. Well, I'm not sure exactly what to think about this article, but you and I will go through this together. WTOP.com reporting, frustrated by Gen Z office workers, companies are turning to etiquette training. Nearly half of companies are now using office etiquette training in an addi- and an additional 18% plan to by the end of next year. That would be 68% according to a recent survey of HR managers. While most doing so are offering the training to all employees, the need has been brought to the front burner by managers' frustration with Gen Z employees and college graduates entering the professional workforce. Managers have called those youngest of workers the most difficult to work with because of poor communication skills and lack of much, if any, prior exposure to the workplace environment and what is and isn't acceptable. It also has a hedge against the talent shortage that companies in most industries are still facing. Companies have had to come to terms that they can't keep firing Gen Zers for not behaving in an office. To counteract that, they're having to teach them how to behave. They're training on things such as how to take constructive criticism, how do you give feedback, and how do you accept it. So it really has to do with communications. Another big part is how you dress in the office. What is appropriate attire? Wow. Okay. Um, well, I'm not known for being the snappiest of dressers. Uh, but I don't wear sweatpants and flip-flops. And um, if you wear your pajamas to work, we'll say something to you at Ramsey. Um, and it might have happened, but not much. The way I answer questions on this is what would I do? So here's what we have done. Uh, we've got a building full of Gen Z and millennials. And we actually love them. We think they're the two greatest generations to come along in forever. Um but what we have laughingly said, and it is actually very true, is there's only two types, excellent and sucks. And so they either are snowflakes that they're helicopter parent and they've been playing uh, Call of Duty at a great call of irony, a great turn of irony, playing Call of Duty in their mother's basement and they're useless to the workforce. Uh, they're not grown up yet. And they come, they would come to work in their pajamas and their you know, haven't bathed and don't know how to talk nice to other people, don't know how to have a, a human conversation because the only way they've ever had a conversation is by text. So um, those are the ones that suck. We don't hire those. Thus, we don't have etiquette training here, and we don't have how to dress appropriately here. Now, we have had conversations from time to time. A leader will pull someone aside and go, 
a uh, you need to wear more clothes. That don't work here. Uh, we don't have a stripper pole, so um, you know we're gonna have to work on this. We've had people that you know we occasionally, but it's in thirty years of doing this. You know we've had some had to have a uh, you know someone sit down and tell you know we've had to pull some young man aside and say, hey, you can't talk to ladies like that. This is not the internet. This is like real life. Somebody will scratch your eyes out, little dude. Man, I mean, and besides that, we'll fire you. That's called sexual harassment. You know, you can't do that. You can't act that way. So that's the extent of our etiquette training, and we'll talk to you a couple times about it, and then after that, we're going to let someone else have you as a problem. So, um, but the ones that we hire, that's such a rare occasion because we so what I'm what I'm saying is is yes, this might be a problem with some portions of Gen Z, because honestly, they've been raised with a magic wand in their hand, and they do all of their communication on this magic wand, and they push a button, and crap shows up on your front porch, and we don't have this, and we have the power of the entire world in our palm, we have all of the world's knowledge in our palm, and so they're and this is native to the way they think and act, and so. Uh, this is a generation that wasn't taught to look someone in the eye if you're going to break up after dating for six months. Instead, they send a text. If you break up by text, you are relationally stunted. Okay? That's what we're talking about here. So, But that's the problem. So now what we find is, is that we get by a stringent hiring process and vetting process, we call out the ones that don't have the social skills to exist in an office building with a thousand people. You know, they, they bathe, they know how to speak to each other reasonably and with kindness. Uh, everyone in your twenties, me included in my twenties, we all have had to learn to do conflict with more class and that's called growing up, but we don't have to have classes on that. So, um, now, I think if, you, if you're at the point in your company that you have to have a class on manners and etiquette and how to dress in the workplace, you have a hiring problem. That's what I think. And we don't have a hiring problem here. Uh, we would rather not hire you if you're a problem and not get the work done than let crazy in the building in flip-flops and in their pajamas. Okay? So you can't come to work here in your pajamas. It won't work. We don't do that. And you got to, you know, you got to behave in a reasonable manner with other human beings. See, what, here's the thing. If you live in uh, a rural setting where there are no humans around, only farm animals, you can behave almost any way you want to behave. The more densely populated the area that you live in, the more civilized you have to become. It's called civilization. And so if you're in a, there's more rules in the city because otherwise humans run over each other. You have a traffic light so that humans don't run over each other. You have stop signs. You don't have that in the middle of Kansas where there's nothing but a cow and a wheat field. Okay. You can just drive a hundred miles an hour out through there. There's nobody to hurt. But when you got a more densely populated situation, which is the workplace, it requires more rules of etiquette, and you have to function at that level. You have to become more civilized. And so the larger company you run leader, the more civilized a leader you're going to have to become. And you guys think I'm wild and crazy now. When there was only 10 of us, I was a complete nut burger. I mean, I, I'm, I, there was nothing holding me back then. Now I'm just bold. You know, that's all it is now. But, oh, my gosh, you can get away with a lot when there's 10 people that you can't get away with when there's 1,000 as a leader. So the, the, the summation of this, and I, I'm spitballing this because I just didn't know what to do with it exactly, but the, the, the summation is you're, you don't need to have an etiquette class or a how-to-dress-at-work class or how-to-do-conflict class for Gen Z and millennials. There's plenty of them that know how to do that if you have a hiring procedure that doesn't let them in the door. Don't hire people that were raised by wolves. It's pretty simple, and then you won't have this issue. You know, and so, no, we're not going to do that here. It's like we've always said, 
you know, we're, we don't have sexual harassment and we're not going to allow it at, at Ramsey. Not because it's a federal issue. My daughters work here. We might have a murder, but we're not going to have sexual harassment. I'm not putting up with it. I'm an old fashioned Southern redneck. You simply don't treat women that way. Well, you're a misogynist. It's a, it's a simple thing. It's how people behave in a civilized society. And at Ramsey, we're somewhat civilized. And so, you know, that, we, you know, so you can't be a creeper and work here. We don't do creepers. And so, you know, we'll talk to you once, maybe twice about it and have a, have a difficult conversation with conflict so that you can get the point. And then you can creep yourself on out of here. Cause we're not going to have ladies, you know, I got a guy's daughter working in here. I'm responsible for her safety. And I take that freaking seriously. So we're not going to have it. I'm not going to have to have a class on it. I'm just going to fire your butt. You're not going to work here. Oh, my God. So, yeah, we're not having a class on etiquette and manners. And we're not having a class on sexual harassment. And we're not having a class. We're going to hire people and we're going to lead in a way where we're involved enough in people's lives and create safety and create dignity and create good, clean communication where people have the opportunity to grow up and get better at everything that they're doing at every age group and get the right kind of people in here that care deeply about the success of the organization and serving the customer, and then I don't have these problems. All the problems that we have are when we don't do that, and these companies, that's where they're having these problems. They shouldn't have hired these people. End of freaking story. This is the Entree Leadership Podcast. This is the Entree Leadership Podcast. We work with 10,000 businesses from five team members to 250 team members all over America. It's what we do a lot, and we have for decades. And uh, we've grown this place from a card table in my living room to about 1,000 folk, now a little over 1,000, and um, a major national brand. And we did all of that using the things we talk about here on this show and the things we talk about in Entree Leadership events and in the book Entree Leadership. And that's our playbook. It's who we are. It's what we do. And it's really, I mean, it's just people doing very practical things around here. I'm so proud of our team. Lee is with us. Lee is in South Carolina. Hi, Leah. How are you? I'm good, Dave. So I see on my screen you got something to brag about. We like having this zone where we have some brags occasionally. Tell me your brag. How you doing? Well, we're doing great, and I'm really glad that you're you know you allow us to do this. Um, so I'm the co-owner with my husband of a catering company and a restaurant. We've had the business for almost 20 years now. Um, last year we did two million in sales. We have 12. Um, full-time staff and about 50 to 60 seasonal um, banquet staff. Um, my brag story comes out of a post-COVID realization that, you know, for the first 19 years of business, we really focused more on success, busy calendars, top line. And after COVID, we just saw the exhaustion in everyone's faces, mm -hmm. first by just trying to save our business. You know, we lost a million dollars in one month of mm. canceled bookings in 2020. Oh, yeah. So it, was, it, was, it was really scary. Yeah. The shutdowns were... I remember entire thing. segments of uh, revenue just evaporating before my eyes. Yeah, yeah. overnight. It, it, I was just... I didn't want to look at my email or answer the phone because I knew it was just another canceled, you know, event in someone's life, too. And so in 2021 and... um 22, there was just so much pent up demand that we were working seven days a week. We were doing three, four, five events every day just to, you know, get everybody on the calendar. And we looked at everybody and we realized pretty quickly we really needed to pour into them. Um, so we shut down the business for three days. We just put signs on the doors and let all of our customers know, hey, we need to recharge and refocus. And my husband and I put together a three-day retreat. We took our staff off-site. We poured into them both in just uh, refocusing our why. Why are we doing this? Why do we work so hard? So we spent a lot of time dialing in on that. That had to blow just, their minds. It did. It 
it just blew our minds of how excited they were to get refocused. And, and how much impact that had. I mean, people, they'll be talking about that 20 years from now. Yeah, well, we, you know, we put a big um, sign up in our kitchen of what our why was that we all developed together. We brought in a translator because we have a lot of Spanish speaking staff. So we brought in a translator to make sure that they felt, you know, that they were being heard as well. Um, And we recharged our minds Um, from that, Dave. We put together what we call a mental wellness fund for our business. So this fund is available to any of our full-time staff that may have any challenges that they face in their life. You know, I know there's a huge focus on everyone having health insurance, but there's not a lot of mental health insurance. Like none. Yeah, that's excellent. Zero. Excellent. Yep. So I think just knowing that, um, them knowing how much we care about them, um, putting them first genuinely not just because it sounds good or we heard it on, you know, a podcast or something, you know, pour into your people, just because we genuinely really wanted to pour into them. Um, our success has been amazing. And we just, we just wanted to share that because it, it truly does make a difference when you put people in front of profit. So what did you see when you say your success shot? Did you see a change in the numbers, a change in the turnover, or just a change in the air, or the culture? Or um, all I would of it? say culture, all of it. Culture came first. Um, people walked a lot straighter. They stood up taller. They were more energetic to answer leads and have conversations with our clients. Things were less daunting because it wasn't just about earning business to get a booking for events. It was more about connecting with clients and making sure that they're the, the right client um, because we don't want to just work seven days a week anymore just to get an event. We want to make sure that they um, know that we are working with integrity, not just serving food, that we're working to be you know passionate about making memories um, and that they're not just another book date. So I would say that that, that came first. Um, and then, you know, the, the profits came after that because genuinely we, we actually work less than we've ever worked in 20 years. So what do you think the the profit, how much do you think profit changed? Um, I would say our profit definitely went up like bottom line 10%. Yeah. Um, okay. Because my, my contention has always been, and, and I've, you know, it's a little bit of a, um, hard thing to trap and uh, to do a control study on to where you can actually create hard numbers to prove it. But my contention has always been, A, I've got better people if I pour into them because the good ones stay because the environment is great. And so my turnover is less. I've got some of the best, most talented people. They're more committed. So we're all more productive and so any three of ours are doing four persons worth of work usually because we just are leaning in so hard because most people don't work that hard. And so we work hard here, all of us. And so I, I'm convinced we get more productivity, which equals profit when it comes right down exactly. to it. If I got one less person to pay out of every four to get a certain amount of work done, then... um if that's the ratio, then my that that's a payroll savings that goes straight to the bottom line in order to get the same amount of gross revenue in. So that's my contention. And the other thing is, is you know, you retain people because you care about them, treat them right. Uh, oh, and you can attract talent like them because you care about them and treat them right and take care of them when they're sick and take care, you know, pay for the marriage counselor, as you said, mental health, when their marriage is struggling or give them some extra uh, grace time when there's a cancer diagnosis because normal PTO just won't cover that. But it's not just for that person you're doing it, but the entire rest of the team is watching when you're doing that. And so my contention has always been that the 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 odd thing is is that by treating people extremely well, the actual result is it's good business and you create more profit. And by the way, you should just do that anyway. But you know what I'm saying? But the, 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 Definitely. and I would do it anyway and you would do it anyway, but I, I'm, I've got a real case to make that there's actual increased profit from it. 
Yeah, and like you said, it's really hard to gauge actual numbers of like it being from the direct result. And we always cared about our people. You know, we're just, you know, genuinely business owners, but we didn't make people first in terms of like, this is why we go to work. Yeah. We, we go to work and we're all producing the same result. And out of that, we're all successful because if we're more successful and there's more to bottom line, then that means more money in your pocket. And like you said, in terms of retaining staff, we've had no turnover. And if anything, there's more people coming to our door because they're hearing about our culture. Yeah. And that is a very real thing that we have heard. And yeah, that's yeah. exciting. That's it. I'm so proud of you. Way oh, to go. Thanks, very cool. Excellent. Excellent job. Thanks for calling in with your brag. Very good job. See, it can be done. And the restaurant business is really, really tough. The catering business, that's hard work, man. It's late at night. Sometimes the customers aren't nice. Sometimes they don't appreciate you. Oh, man, that's a tough world dealing with straight, dealing straight with the public on that. That's a, the real deal for sure. Hey, folks, that's the Entree Leadership Podcast. Remember, better a weary warrior than a quivering critic. Leaders serve. Leaders are active, not passive. Leaders act on principle, not appearances. This world needs more high-quality leaders. So choose to lead. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host, and thanks for listening to the Entree Leadership Podcast.